Hey everyone, it's Charlie Webster here. Welcome along to My Sport in Mind, the podcast all about opening up the conversation around mental health in sport and life. Season two is proudly supported by sportinglife.com, expert insight, passionate opinion, and in-depth analysis for the sports you love, all for free. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Hal Robson Carnu to the podcast. Welcome along, Hal. Um, Hi, Charlie. Thank you for having me. It's been quite a tough season, it seems, certainly on the field anyway. I've been through lots of relegations myself, and fans talk about it so much, but less so on the impact it has on players. What's it actually like for a player? I mean, you went through relegation only two or three seasons ago with West Brom, um, with 2008. So what what impact does it have on you? What's it feel like? Yeah, it's um, it's not a nice feeling. Like it's uh, you know your feet, you're you're finishing in the you know in, in the bottom three sort of positions of the league. Um, so ultimately, you can't really say you've had a successful season when you've been relegated, regardless of you know what you've done, you know, your level of performance, what, you know, what goals you've scored, because ultimately it's a, it's a team game. Um, you know, fortunately, you know, for me, you're being relegated from the top league in the world. So psychologically, you know, we're talking sort of mentality, like you immediately have to pull the positives out of it that, you know, you're, 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 you're at that level, you know, you're, you're, there's 20 teams in the UK who can play, in the top league in the world so it's like your your the positives are is that you know you've you've whether it's you've gained that experience you know you've competed at that level you've you know shown that you can perform at that level so really it's just you very like what from my personal experience you just have to you know dust yourself down as quickly as possible and be ready to to you know to, to get back into that position again and and really prepare yourself to fight for it are you somebody who finds it easy to to see the positives and and just yourself off? Yeah, I think you know. Don't don't get me wrong. Like it it, it certainly hurts inside. Like it's um, you know it's painful, and you know one. I think any anyone who plays in the in the professional game is you have to be a winner because you know regardless of you know becoming becoming a, a footballer, just a footballer, you know, professional footballer, like it's it's a stat that it's harder to become a professional footballer than it is to get into Oxford or Cambridge based on the numbers, you know, and based on the competitive nature that when you're a kid, every single boy wants to become a footballer, you know, so, you know, apart from, apart from the anomaly, you know, pretty much every kid will at some point, you know, in their childhood want to become a footballer and, and be inspired to do so. So it's like, I think always bearing that in mind, I think gives you a level of, you know, of grounding and you, you end up not getting carried away, but with the highs and with the lows, because it's like, that's the biggest thing. And, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that, that I've ever, you know, sort of the most impactful thing that I've learned is to, 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 to not get too carried away with the highs and not get too carried away with the lows. And I think, in this case, we're, you know, we're obviously in a low, you know, haven't been relegated, but you, you need to not get carried away of it and actually, you know, try and centre yourself. And, and as you said, you know, look, look at the positives. Yeah, I was going to ask what you've learned over a period of time, especially psychologically, because I'm glad that you mentioned the very small percentage of athletes that become professional sports you know, players, never mind in football, is so, so minor. And I mean, it's really interesting because there's so much studies on how the mind works of a professional athlete and how there's similarities across the core where it's that almost like one track mind. Is there anything you you do particularly that helps you ground yourself? Because I can imagine that's very hard, especially at a younger age when so much depends on it. And there's a lot of outside criticism going on as well and outside noise. Mm. Yeah, I think it's like understanding what your motivation is and um, and then learning very quickly to compete with yourself. So what I mean by that is like you don't use someone else as a metric for your success. So you don't say, oh, he's, he's done this, so I should be doing this. So you never do that. You actually just say, I am here. If you want to go from A to B, that's no problem at all. You know, you want to get from where you are to, to where you want to be, but you have to realize that it's fundamentally and solely down to you. So when you have that, so when you have that mentality where you, you know, where you then, you know, sort of compete against yourself, I think that's the, 
the key to you know to to really um making sure you you you, you know you you're, you're never um yeah to, to making sure you you almost live like like a balanced lifestyle to a degree like where you're not you know getting caught up with every because it's so easy to get caught up with everything in life you know everyone's struggling at some point and in some stage and everyone has ambitions of where they want to get to and it's like you know all the time it's almost like what's next so it's like oh if I had this I would be there you know if I had this I would feel a certain way but when you get there you're going to want something else and you're going to want something else so if you have that it's fine to have a driven mentality but you need to know that that doesn't define you Mm -hmm. if that makes sense and I think when you sort of live within that space I think that's where you really find you know what I'd call like you know grounded space you know grounded being and like you don't like no one you're not competing with anyone you're not you know there's no you know you don't have an ego to try and like you know to to say oh I've done this and I've done that it's actually just you know I'm on my journey and I'm you know enjoying the journey that I'm on and so you know we're going to go through you know ups and downs and we're going to experience you know um, events in, along that journey but you know ultimately life is is a journey so yeah I think that's that's sort of where where I sort of sit. How real is that as well is that like comparison thing I was just like nodding my head when you were talking mm. and also that that constant need for achievement and then you achieve it and then it's like I'm so bad for that I'll have a day and then I'll just be like what's next and I find it so hard sometimes in my brain to just be like okay calm down calm down so what is your motivation then what is it the thing that drives you um yeah I think like to be fair like I just want to give the best that I can give and that's in whatever it is so it's like you know whether it's football or whether it's business or whether it's my family like I just want to give the best that I can give and it's you know sometimes that might not be good enough for you know the the ones be you know judging or the ones you know or you know the the people around me but as long as I know I've given my best like that's really what what motivates me and so you know whether it's getting to training and you know being fully focused and you know preparing right uh, you know going through my routine and then on the on the training pitch you know give giving my giving my all and I think that's something I really enjoy, like coming off the training pitch, knowing that I've given absolutely everything that I can on that day. And I think, you know, any coach or manager who's, you know, you, you'd speak about who's tra- like worked with me, you know, would say that that's just in my characteristic. It's just like built in me. And so I've sort of taken that into other areas. So, you know, whether it's, you know, business with the tournament co, you know, I do that. I have that same mentality. So when I'm in work mode like I'm in work mode I'm giving my all you know I'm fully focused on it and then you know obviously then you know with my family it's it's nice to then be able to switch off and be with them and and, you know and and be present with them and so um yeah I think uh, I think that's that's what you know sort of motivates me and so wherever that sits like I'm I'm always just trying to trying to do that so right you've mentioned the turmeric co so let's talk about that a little bit because um just before we started recording, we were just chatting about where we lived, right? And you said that you, um, tra- when you're traveling to training, you that's your time, right? So is that when you work on your business? And I'm so intrigued by this because I actually do these turmeric and ginger and lemon shots that I make myself. And I started doing them because I spent some time in India and every morning, that's what they'd that's what they'd give us. And then there was an alternative one, I think another day, which I can't remember what it was. And then I started making my mom do it. And then I started making my friend do it. And we all do those shots and we make our own. Where did it come from for you then? Mm, that's fascinating. Yeah. So um, am I doing the right so, thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll find out how you're actually, you know, extracting it. But it's um, and what form of turmeric you're using. It, it could, so is it powder or is it the root? Um, it depends. So I've got the powder in my cupboard. So that's why I use the majority of the time. But when I when I can boot, oh no, oh no, <laughs> like, <laughs> that, um, but when I can find it, I do have like a little green grocer that does the turmeric root. And so then I get the mm. root when like I'm around and I've got time and I can catch the grocers. Yeah, yeah. So is it about so, the So to give it, so 
with the turmeric we're shipping in around five tons of turmeric each month so or turmeric roots each month sorry so whether it's the so yeah the root is what you need basically nice. um but it's um but yeah so lesson is get the roots not the yeah, powder <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so you know but um but no so the turmeric co so i founded it in 2018 and at that point in time i had been using these shots for over a decade and these shots are the reason why you know i've effectively had the career that i've had um so when i was uh, 17 i suffered a cruciate knee ligament injury and required um, reconstructive surgery. So was out of the game for you know 12 months, came back, suffered the same injury again. And after the second injury, the surgeon said to my dad that I should you know really begin looking at a different career path mm -hmm. because I would never play without pain and restriction again. And being young and you know really determined to, to have a career, like I was like, no, like I'll come back, you know, it won't be an issue. So anyway, went through the rehabilitation the second time round, the surgery second time round, and got back um, training. And I just couldn't play without, you know, pain or restriction. I was just constantly hampered by it. So you know, every time I'd warm up, you know, train, I couldn't like, you know, sprint. I couldn't change direction. Um, after training, my knee would just swell up, and I began having um, the doctors at the uh, time. I was at Reading. Um, they began. Um, prescribing me anti-inflammatory so I as a eight to 18 year old now you know um, began popping these anti-inflammatory drugs like smarties to try and like oh, that's you know, so common in sport as well isn't it so common and particularly like you know we're, we're talking a decade and a half ago so it was like back then it was just even you know we, we, yeah, we, we've come a long way since then, but it's still apparent in today's, you know, what, you know, um, sp uh, sports. And so anyway, began having these um, anti-inflammatory drugs like Smarties and within a few weeks, my body just reacted to them. So I started passing blood in my urine, I couldn't sleep, um, you know, would, would uh, vomit, you know, after training. And so I had to stop taking these drugs, which had taken the edge off the pain that I was feeling, like didn't, you know, certainly didn't um, resolve it. Um, or I would have to play with this, you know, this pain and pain and restriction constantly. So I remember it was, um, you know, just played a reserve game, you know, had come home, like literally couldn't played it like 30% of what I could knew I could play at because of my, you know, physical condition and went to walk up the stairs and the pain in my knee, I just couldn't literally walk up the stairs. And I just broke down in tears. And my dad was at the house at the, at, the, at the time. And we were just like, there must be a natural way that, you know, that we can basically, I can recover from, you know, the pain that I'm experiencing. So next few weeks, we just went on like a research binge and we just went, you know, looked at all different like natural ways of like treating pain, inflammation, swelling, and, you know, um, looked at various like, you know, documents. I remember we got, you know, we got um, an, an archive document on spices, you know, medicinal spices from the local library and it come from China, you know, so Eastern medicine. And um, eventually like we began seeing these patterns and it spoke about, you know, pineapple, pomegranate, watermelon, ginger, and then subsequently turmeric. And um, it was like the, the pattern just kept occurring. So it was like, okay, well then these are the best ingredients for me to really recover from. And um, so, you know, we basically had to get it into a format that I could consume. So again, we you know, looked into it. My dad then began buying all of these natural ingredients. We realized very quickly that it was the raw root that we needed and not like the spices and the, you know, what, what we would traditionally use is like the herbs for tasting, you know, that you'd cook with. We need it in its raw, its format. So you know eventually got these ingredients together my dad just began like con concocting you know this liquid form of these ingredients combined um and you know after yeah probably over a hundred attempts of of making it we eventually got to something where i was like okay yeah this is you know firstly edible um but secondly that you know i could have on a consistent basis and I remember the first time I, you know, drank it, it was like, wow, really not my, you know, not my socks off. I was like, you know, that is strong and potent. And being a teenager at the time, my body was just naturally nutrient deficient because of my diet. Like I lived on pasta, chicken and beans. Like I didn't go out outside of that because when you're young, you know, you just think protein, carbohydrates, et cetera. Yeah. 
So my body was nutrient deficient. So, you know, consuming this, you know, shot with so many functional ingredients in their raw form, it really, you know, uh, I could really feel the effect, you know, almost immediately. And so I literally had these shots. So I had two or three of these, you know, small little, you know, liquors. We, we had them in just little glasses at the time. And I had them, you know, my dad would make them every few days and I'd drink them. And within six weeks, you know, it was, you know, probably around five, five weeks and five days. I literally remember wo I woke up, was getting ready for, you know, training day, walked in, walked into the bathroom, went into the shower, turned the shower and I was in the shower and I just literally like had a light bulb moment. It was like the first time in two and a half years I'd woken up without pain or restriction in my knee. And it was like, it just blew my mind because it, that, at that, as a young teenager, I had no concept of the impact that nutrition had on your body or your physical health. And so it literally was a light bulb moment for me. And, um, and yeah, and so since that moment, like I've, I've had these shots, you know, pretty much every single day and within a year, you know, I'd made my first team debut a year after that, I made my, you know, um, international debut a year after that, I made my premier league debut and really without the range, like I literally wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have had the career that I've had. And so, but as we've gone through time, you know, being a sort of in my twenties, I began, my teammates began seeing it. And so I'd give them to my teammates, then family and friends would have them, we'd be giving them to family and friends. And, you know, by the time we, um, you know, decided to launch it as a, you know, brand, um, uh, we were making, you know, hundreds of these, you know, little shots a week and just giving them out to people because people were, rel were relying on them. And what we realized were that people were using them for, various different health reasons so it was like you know whether it was pain or it was inflammation whether it was that you know to boost their overall health or well-being you know whether it was to boost their energy and everyone around us was just like you know just addicted to this natural shot and so yeah we decided to launch it because I saw a you know health shot you know which claimed to be turmeric but actually was like one percent turmeric powder and then like 98 percent apple juice I saw it on the shelf in Harrods. They you know, charge sort of about in, a fiver for it or something. Yeah, exactly. So I saw it in the shelf on, on in Harrods in, you know, sort of 2016-17, saw it, didn't really look at the ingredients. I was like, yeah, turmeric shot, amazing. Like, we don't have to make it anymore. Finally, someone, you know, a, a company's clocked on, so bought a load, took them home, went to drink it, and literally had to spit it out. Couldn't believe how inferior it was to what we were making. And... Um, and then, yeah, so launched in 2018 and within a few months we were, you know, stocked in the likes of Whole Foods, Planet Organic, you know, we were supplying England rugby national team with the range, you know, we built the business as like a, you know, what they call a digitally native vertical brand. So it's like, ideally we want to send a product directly to you and build that relationship with you and, you know, have, uh, you know, follow you through your journey as a customer of ours. And, you know, we're now, you know, distributing hundreds of thousands of our you know shots on a monthly basis you know with tens of thousands of people are using our product on a, on a daily basis and you know we've got you know over ten thousand you know positive customer reviews just talking about the impact that the range has had on their health and well-being and so yeah it's um it's a real it's great to to, to be sort of you know the founder of, of the company and you know so involved and in, you know building the the business and the brand and, and the team you know um alongside obviously you know being a professional athlete it's such a testimony as well that you just said the fact that you accredit a lot of your career and being able to play like you have done on something so natural and i mean it's got incredible anti-inflammatory um I just want to go back a little bit because I just think when you were talking about, well, firstly, your dad's amazing <laughs> that he mm -hmm. worked with you to do that. But when you were talking about that, you were not being able to play without pain and being in that situation at such a young age. And you said that you were just still determined. And when the doctor said to you, you might have to think about a different career. You were like, no, how hard was that for you mentally? Or were you yeah. just like, no, no no yeah it was it was tough and like yeah no one everyone just sees you know the end result right it's always yeah. the case because then they see you know international player premier league player you know but no one sees you know uh, during that period yeah, yeah no one sees it during that period of my first injury to that moment where you know I realized that I didn't have to play with pain again like I 
literally broke down in tears, was crying, you know, crying in my bed, you know, dozens upon dozens of times, you know, fear of not actually being able to achieve something I desperately wanted, yeah. like riddled me throughout that period. But I was, but coupled with that, I had a steely determination where at the end of every single, you know, time I was feeling like I had that insecurity and that fear, I would then, you know, try my best to match it with, you know, a thought of, you know, just utter determination, like, no, well, that can have, like, of course that might happen, but I will equally give as much as I can for it not to happen and for me to have, you know, to, to, to actually achieve what I want to achieve. And so, but no one will see that and, you know, the tears and like, even like after the first, after the first injury, when I had the second injury, like I had, you have to go to like through like two or three operations. So, so you have to be, you know, go, go into, you know, general anesthetic two or three times where they'll do like an arthroscopy, then they'll do, you know, the reconstructive surgery, then they'll, you know, have a, uh, you know, another, potentially another arthroscopy if there's, you know, issues. So you're going through these, you know, surgeries and each one is an ordeal. You're going into hospital, you know, you're going, you know, you're, you're going under general anesthetic. And after the second operation, my wound got infected wow. and like I and I had like a severe like literally like viral symptoms where I was like literally like my temperature was through the roof like I was pale you know my there was um, you know pus seeping out of the wound of my knee and it's like no one no one sees that and to experience that you know and the tears and the fear but looking back now because I was able to, you know, it, uh, I was just so determined to like come through it. Like I, I was able to build up like, you know, not, not really, I don't want to describe it as like a, you know, a steely de de determination, but I just, it, it, it taught me about my mind, you know, and the power of, of the mind. And it's like, you can really overcome situations and scenarios if you can think about what you're thinking about and understand how and why you feel a certain way, yeah. right? And what that means is like, okay, I'm feeling fear now. Okay, so why am I feeling fear? I'm feeling fear because I may not achieve my dreams. Okay, well then, is that, uh, is that a possibility? Yes, it is. It, it could be a possibility. Like, but is me feeling this way at this moment in time gonna have any direct impact on the outcome of that event well no it's not so do i need to feel this way mm. well no you don't so you can actually be happy in times of you know fear or in times of insecurity and that's like it taught me like taught me around about the mind like really like and you know i did a lot of deep and internal you know and um, thinking and i you know read a lot of books around you know sort of mentality and your approach to you know, to overcoming situations and understanding, you know, trying to understand yourself because you're always on a journey, you're always developing, you're always growing. And so, yeah, I think looking back, I'm grateful for that experience for so many reasons, you know, not only because it led me to, found, you know, founding the Turmeric Company, which is now helping, you know, hundreds of others, of thousands of people, but actually because of, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the individual human that, you know, it helped me turn into. So It's interesting, the patterns of um, behavior, because a, a psychologist I worked with taught similar, where it was like, what are you feeling to try and connect with yourself to understand what you're feeling? Because I think sometimes we see it so outwardly and don't actually say, oh, I'm actually feeling fear. And then very similar to you, like what, what you're actually feeling right now. And then what do you need to do about it? um you know is in like I'm feeling fear I'm feeling fear because I'm going into hospital all the time and I don't know whether I'm going to be able to mm. achieve what I'm going to achieve um that's normal to feel that fear what do I need to do about it so it's mm. like going through that that pattern and that process on the other the other side of things it's when I've spoken to different people like for example um Johnny May he was talking about for him it's just all rugby and that's all he focuses on how important do you think it is for footballers um, and how much has it helped you to have something else to focus on other than just your sport? Yeah, I think for, for me personally, it's been like I've 
it's been amazing like because I think in sport like firstly like in sport like mental health is like so underreported it's just embarrassing like and you know something needs to be done at a deeper level where professional athletes can actually communicate how they feel like and it's like and what I mean by that is the day when you as a um, an athlete can go and communicate an insecurity to a um, a manager or a you know a, a director at the club, and for it to have no impact on you on your career, you know. And what I mean by that is, you know, could that impact how you're you know you starting on the weekend? Could that impact a future contract? You know, if you said to, went to the to 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 a manager of any club and said hey boss, you know, I'm, I'm really nervous and afraid about this game on the weekend. You're probably not going to play, you know, but I can tell you hands down 90% of, you know, the professional athletes who play week in and week out have fear going into a game. So it's like, so, so how can, you know, so, so, so people are, you're, so you're suppressing how you feel you're suppressing your feelings constantly constantly and ultimately over time when you do that that's what causes you know you then need to have a release you know is it you know is it drugs is it you know gambling is it you know addictions you know where that's where it comes from because you're not actually being able to express how you feel openly within the environment that you're in so I think like um yeah I think it's um for me being able to um i've sort of used you know what what i you know the, my, my the business as you know i've been able to really stimulate my mind and really keep it occupied when i'm away from the game and i think some players you know they'll look to as we said like when it's um when you're having difficulties you know mentally when you know in terms of your thoughts how you're feeling you know the mood which is, you know, very common. Everyone f- feels, you know, moods and feels, you know, mood swings and feels, you know, various things. But if you, some players will look at releases and some players will have like golf as an example. And, and, and actually that can be a positive release where they just literally focus on that and, you know, go, go and release it, then, you know, mentally have, have occupy their minds with that. Or, um, you know, other players will play, you know, FIFA until, you know, 1 p.m. in the afternoon until like 2 a.m. at night. And it's like, or COD, you know, Call of Duty, which is, you know, great. Like it's, they're they're able to, you know, that's, they're expressing themselves, they're taking themselves away from, you know, um, the pressures of the, you know, the the sporting world. And so for me, like I've, I've really enjoyed being able to channel, you know, my, my thoughts into, you know, something so productive with the business. And so, you know, you know, I'm, I'm managing, you know, sort of probably 30 staff within the business now and, you know, various functions and various teams and, you know, we're, we're, it's, um, it's, it's taught me and it's really sort of grown my character because I've, you know, I've stepped into that managerial role while still I'm being a player, you know, being a player and a professional player, you know, where you have managers, you know, obviously, uh, you know, um, who you have to obviously look up to and, you know, be, be guided by. So for me, I think having that, um, being able to compartmentalize the two has been really good. And I think if you are a thinker, you know, some people are, thinkers and some people aren't like they're just if you're not you're sort of you're lucky in a sense because you'll just go with the flow you know you'll just go you know if it's good it's good if it's bad it's bad you know just keep going keep going whereas like if you're a thinker and a really deep thinker then that's where you something like professional football can really eat you up because there are you know it's it's a ruthless industry and like it's so competitive so if you think about things like too deeply, like it will really eat you up and, you know, and spit you out. And, and, and I think, um, yeah, so I think being a deep thinker myself, like I've been able to, you know, really channel that into really, you know, positive areas. And, um, you know, it's allowed me to you know, um, have the freedom to, 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 to play in the game as well. What you were saying about um, football, I always find this, that, we talk about mental health and there's a lot of campaigns going on, but I find that in sport, it's so conflicting because of exactly what you said. It's 
a manager would immediately see that as a weakness or not necessarily because they maybe have that view or it's their fault, but because of the pressures of the game that they can't risk taking a risk on that player because they've got to win the game because of that relegation promotion or that amount of money or whatever, or the owners or about being getting sacked. So how can that shift so that players can speak openly about mental health? Because like you said, everybody's feeling it anyway. So it's almost like there's all this fear and anxiety, which is 100% normal, that's been completely repressed that everybody knows about. But as long as you don't speak about it, because if you air it, then that can be seen as, like you said, a weakness. I just think it's so conflicting. And I think unless we culturally think differently about it, how is it going to shift things? Yeah, I think like that's that's such a, it's a deeper and broader question than like, because it's like, so what, so fundamentally what we're saying is that like the structure of the game would need to change because we're saying what is the drive of that pressure so it's like you know it's the pressure of the game which causes that that insecurity which means people cannot be open enough or be vulnerable enough because they may risk getting hurt or it, they may risk um you know causing you know detriment to their own self but then on the flip side, it's like, why does everyone love the game? Because of but the pressure. Think, but then do you think you can still have the pressure? Because there's nothing wrong with pressure as long as you can be open, right? Mm -hmm. So can you still have the pressure? Because I think pressure is fine to an extent. Yeah. As long as you can be open and talk about mental health openly, because then that's how you actually cope with the pressure. So actually it's beneficial for everybody because you get a better result. There you go. That's yeah. all. <laughs> yeah precisely but then it's like but then you need the, the powers that be to have that level of empathy mm -hmm. to manage that level of openness and not um, and not be influenced by that in their decision making so it's mm -hmm. like so you need yeah so I, I think we're, we you know it's progressing of course it's progressing it's that you look at 20 years ago 30 40 years ago of course it's progressing so really like where we're going to like is people you know, you need, you know, man, you like you need like in clubs like to have like a, a real deep understanding of you know people and of human beings and like and I think that's that's where ultimately it needs to get to. It just depends on you know how quickly and and what are the drivers of us getting there because it's like you know do we have to you know lose more people you know to the pressures of the game. Um, in order for for real positive change to be made or, or can we you know take it upon ourselves to actually you know um, implement you know some you know uh, structures or support the various people or the teams within the game or within the sport to actually allow you know people to express themselves however they choose so yeah it made me think um I was going to ask you about managers that you've worked under and maybe good managers that are empathetic. But when you said lost, that we've lost in the game, it made me think of Gary Speed because I know you played under him um, for Wales and I knew him fairly well as well um, and did some stuff with him when he was manager of Sheffield United. What was that like for you when that happened? Um, yeah, that was it, was, it was extremely difficult. And I think because where he sort of we looked at him as you know like a father figure because he brought a group of young players together and implemented his experience in the game of you know understanding what it took at a top level the you know the discipline you know the the um uh, you know the the level of attention to detail you know the analysis um he, he brought that to, to, to Wales he was the first one and, and and when he did that like he brought together that group which ultimately obviously had the you know success of you know the Euros and now obviously you know future generations they're all experiencing that same the benefit like it, it, it was fundamentally down to him and I think so when we were you know when obviously you know we, we found found out about the news like it was um it was so difficult to take because you couldn't comprehend why he would do that you know, you didn't like speaking with him, like he, he, he gave, he made you feel secure. He made you feel, 
um, you know, um, yeah, almost that peace with yourself. Like you never, he was just so like, it was incredible. And so, but then to think that, you know, he was in a place where that that had to happen or, you know, he, he felt that that was his only choice or his only option, like is, it's it's extremely difficult to to you know to to process and and I think it affected everyone in that group um you know in in a way where actually you know it was you know it was um you know it was a challenging time and um and obviously you know yeah his young family at the time his boys and it was um yeah it was really difficult and you know um it's uh it just shows the the importance of you know having having people and you know, being able to communicate and being able to express yourself because there was something there where he felt he couldn't express himself and so um you know i think um it, it definitely shaped a, a big group of of that core and and you know um and me included yeah did you ever speak to anyone or did you you know you said it's importance of communicating who do you communicate to is it your family or did you ever speak to anyone around that time or now yeah i think um Yes, I speak to my family, you know, we've got quite, you know, relatively close family and um, it was it was just a difficult time. And, and I think, um, you know, who, who do I personally speak with? You know, I've, I've had, you know, some really great mentors over the years and, and like, some great people who, you know, who have believed in me and like, um, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. The likes of, you know, Dermot Drummy, who again, you know, he actually, you know, he obviously passed away. Um, you know, similar to, to Gary Speed, and he, he was he was the one who, as a ten year old um, on trial at Arsenal, he pointed me out in, in a group, you know, group of thirty five boys, and said, "He's the one we want." And you know, next thing I knew, I was you know up at Arsenal's training ground at she- uh, London Colney, you know, Shenley, and meeting with Liam Brady, meeting with Patrick Vieira, meeting with Arsenal Wenger, and you know, that as a ten year old. Mm-hmm. That was down to to Dermot Drummy, and because he he identified, he saw something in me, and and then obviously through the years, then of you know the next sort of you know figurehead who sort of you know helped guide me in my career was you know obviously um, you know Eamon Dolan, um, who was the academy manager at Reading and and former professional footballer, um, and he he was you know he was a, again another father figure for me as a as a kid at, at Reading, and he was actually. A pivotal figure in me recovering from my injuries he would always give me that belief and you know whenever I was around him he'd say you'll be back kid you'll be back son you'll be back kid and um unfortunately you know he he, he he's passed away of, of cancer and um you know so it's you you go through like it's just yeah I think having those pivotal figures in in your life you know really do help but obviously losing them it it's um you know it, it's really tough but ultimately it realizes the impact that it makes you realize the impact that they had on your life so in essence you almost want to give more for yourself and give that to other people too and so yeah I think um yeah uh, as I said uh, I've had I've been fortunate enough to have people like that in my life and you know now you know I have uh, you know obviously my family and um, you know, who, who I'm able to communicate to, you know, with. So, yeah, very fortunate and, and grateful in that sense. Yeah, and they must have been huge losses. And at the same time, you can see how much impact they had on you and, and hearing your voice. What would you, you know, we were talking about the importance of mentorship. What would you say to any younger, like lad or lass, actually, girl or boy, um, coming through professional sport? um yeah it depends like uh, to be honest like I, I would just you know I would just say what what do you want you know I'd ask them I'd want to know what they want and if if whatever they said like I would just say you know the first thing I'd say is that you can achieve it you know and then I'd say you know um but you you want to be happy like be, be happy like you don't need you don't need things and that's this is the world that we live in you know I've got three kids and you know it's they they go to school and I see what they come back with and what they say and how they communicate and like you can see it's we we live in you know a, a, a consumer driven society you know it's very consumerism it's like you know we're defined by 
what we have around us you know what objects we have what things we can you know buy and and really if you go deeper in in life you realize that actually you know um you begin to think about things like the soul and things like the spirit and things like you know the you know um your faith you know it's it's it goes deeper than anything material that we have and so i would you know make sure that whatever they're searching for whatever they want they realize it's already within them and i think that would be the biggest you know thing that i would want to you know get across and communicate and i think um when you realize that as a being you 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 know you 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 become limitless like you 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 know you nothing or you know you nothing can hold you back because you already have everything that you need um so yeah yeah i think everything shifts when you don't put it into something that's material and what would you say to anyone struggling out there at the moment what things have helped you in the past i would say uh, you know i think it's obviously you have to you know you have to be able to communicate to, to, to how you're feeling but sometimes like you're not always going to have that because like we said like in sport you can't you, most often you can't communicate with your manager you can't you might not even be able to communicate with your peers because you know they, they might then you know you the fear of you know losing them alongside you like there's so many different dynamics and that's just within sport let alone in you know in the office environments work environments you know uh, whatever it is and so family environment so uh, I think the biggest thing like you, that I would say to anyone is like just you know understanding yourself and you you have to understand like why and why you're feeling and thinking certain ways and I think we get we get taught early on you know growing up and the information that you know we we get given you know in society in this day and age it's almost like we get taught that we're in like a feedback loop so whatever we experience we're taught we must feel right so okay like someone calls you a name okay i'm unhappy why did they call me that name yeah that's not nice like then it's not nice so it's not nice so i'm i'm gonna feel unhappy so this feedback loop is like really detrimental to how you feel and how you think and i think what you want to try and do is like try and break you know you have to break that because you have to realize that nothing externally can truly impact you internally and what i mean by that is that you ultimately become you know the master of how you feel because of how you think so it's like that i think is is what i if that can be taught and really felt then you realize that when you wake up today regardless of how you how you, where you are what you're doing anything external in your life you can decide how you're actually going to feel and i think that is really when you can empower yourself and really find solace and you know um uh, you know find yourself essentially and i think this is when you you know when you look at you know you go back in history and you read about you know like the, the the beings that had you know a real you know aura or times of like you know real um uh, you know real happiness like i think that was the core philosophy and i think because of the you know the world we live in today which is phenomenal because of the technological innovation and the access to information etc we have it's made us really like look outside of ourselves at every single opportunity and actually what that has meant is that we've lost who we are and so i think like bridging like you know bridging that gap and pulling that gap back and you know connecting your body with your mind and your soul and your you know how you feel i think is the is the key to 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 you know feeling yeah it's like constant distraction we've almost become more unhappy because it's just sensory overload all the time and mm. and constant wants and needs what how did you get to that stage then do you do you think are you at that stage where you can just go this is i'm in control of how i feel and anything that comes in you aren't affected by it like what's been the process for you no i think like you're always going to be affected by anything like around you like no one's like living like the buddha out here like that that's a fact but what you can look at is like your your refractionary period so how long are you in that state 
right? So it's like someone cuts you up on, you know, the, the mo motorway. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're angry, you're annoyed. Like certain people will take that anger and that annoyance okay. with them for the rest of the day. Yeah. Whereas, you know, what I would say is like, you know, I'll be out of that within, you know, half a second. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. You know, they must be in a rush. You know, they must be, they, they could, they could be emergency. Like actually, no, like, please go on. Like, no, like, you know, so it's like shifting that mentality. So yeah, I would say that is, yeah, that's, that's what I, you know, sort of, that's what I try and, you know, do anyway. Yeah. Thinking outside of yourself. I think that's a really good point. I think we're often like, what the and then we're not we're not seeing what somebody else might be going through or what, yeah, exactly. what that circumstance is it's been absolutely brilliant speaking to you thank you so much no absolute pleasure thank you so much for having me on and uh, yeah hope to catch up with you again soon